Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day and you are listening to the Addicted Mind podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterland, and we are on to another episode. Our guest today is Nadia Davis. Nadia is a mom, attorney, victim's right advocate, kudalingi yoga instructor, and author of the book, Home is Within You, a memoir of recovery and redemption. She is a survivor of trauma and abuse, a near fatal car accident, addiction, and public shaming. Nadia has a lifetime record of passionate work and dedication to improving the lives of others, for which she received numerous awards. In addition to speaking and writing, she's developed a nonprofit to provide skilled navigators of mothers in the justice system. Nadia has a BA from UCLA and a JD from Loyola Law School. So today, Today, Nadia is going to share her story of being a young Latina lawyer on a meteoric rise to the depths of darkness, including trauma, addiction, and the choking grasp of public shame. She's going to share her brutally honest story from brokenness to wholeness. She is really passionate about putting an end to the stigma of shame that surrounds mental health and addiction and keeps so many from healing and reaching out for help. I loved Nadia's just frankness and brutal honesty. It was so meaningful and refreshing, and I hope you enjoy this episode as well. If you're enjoying the Addicted Mind podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. I really do read them. They mean a lot to me. And sometimes I'm just really blown away uh, about how this podcast has a positive impact on so many people. So the people who have written a review, thank you so much for doing that. It really gives me a lot of energy to keep going and keep doing this and keep putting this work out there. So thank you so much for all of you that have taken the time to make that happen and and write a review. It means a lot to me. And you can now find us on Instagram. Just go to Addicted Mind Podcast and follow us there. All right. Stay tuned for this episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Addicted Mind Podcast. My guest today is Nadia Davis, and she is going to share her story of recovery and redemption. And she's also the author of Home is Within You, a memoir of recovery and redemption. Nadia, I'm excited to talk with you. I'm excited to hear your story of walking through recovery and mental health and and getting better and thriving and moving past all the hurt and pain. So Nadia, let's let's just jump in and introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about you and, and we'll get into your story. Thank you. My name is Nadia Davis. And first and foremost, I'm a mother, a mother of three sons, 19 and seven-year-old twin boys. So there's a lot going on most of the time. I am an attorney. I would imagine. (laughs) I have kids. (laughs) It's busy. Yeah, so you get it. I am an attorney and advocate at heart. I am a Kundalini Yoga teacher and have been trained in level one and three level twos, mind and meditation, authentic relationships, conscious communication. And the most special to me was the Japji language and an author now, a published author. So very blessed. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So let's start with your story. When did this all start to, I guess, uh, unravel and kind of start to start to happen? I was a late bloomer in terms of addiction and alcoholism. And prior to that, for two and a half decades, I lived on a set of mental intrigues. And the way that that most of us live in this like grin and bear it mode, right. like running to stand still. And my aim was to save the world. And that was how I found self-worth. That's how I found purpose. That's how I got through not understanding at the time some childhood trauma being in like an overachiever like really like just you know you're a lawyer you're doing all these amazing things yeah i mean uh, living the age of 10 it was you know food drives it was you know amnesty international like every the only way that i understood life was it's me 
and the world. And it was an isolated box of an existence. And what I understood was, I am this mind and I am this body. And I think that carried me in a good way throughout the next couple of decades. And I became an attorney following in the footsteps of my father, who had passed abruptly in law school. I had a near-death car accident, um, 22 broken bones, my brain bled. Oh, my goodness. Wasn't breathing when they found me. I was representing a wrongfully convicted kid at the time and elected school board member. And what got me going and up and out, again, were the causes I believed in. And I started right. having a lot of childhood flashbacks and other flashbacks after I further catapulted into public life and had married the state attorney general. And right, right, yeah. I didn't know that I was existing in the way that I was. I started managing chronic pain, flashbacks, trauma symptoms with alcohol had got addicted for a short period of time on a drug. And then, you know, it worked in the normal yeah, grin and bear yeah. mode. Yeah, from the outside. I mean, that's the kind of crazy part mm -hmm. of it, right? Like, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's I'm doing everything right. I'm, you know, here I am, but not realizing this undercurrent of, of trauma is there. Right. And this pursuit is in a way to keep it away, but you can't, you can't see it at the time. You, you, it's hard to know it. Right. Absolutely. And we live in that green and bear mode because it's praised. Yeah. And the little girl in me was the advocate, the fighter. And I never understood how to do that for myself. And when we have trauma, the markings on the brain are so deep let alone our yeah. mind is survivalist in nature. And so it will create every single thought as though it's protecting us. And so I started having depths of shame. And when it is in shame, the awareness of the thoughts and the trauma triggers and all of that that was going on in my head in the early years of marriage were so overwhelming. I lived in a pretty much disassociated state for, for quite a while and managing some of the unhealthy things in the marriage, very little emotional connection. And I did not know what a healthy attachment or what secure attachment was. So I didn't know what I was right. missing, you know? Yeah, you can't, you can't know what you don't know. I think that's hard for people to understand who maybe come from a, I guess, a healthier place, mm -hmm. like it seems natural to them. But I think like what you're saying, when we have trauma, this state is natural to someone who's a trauma survivor. It's almost like this is just, this, it, there is another mm -hmm. way. I didn't even know there was another way. Right. And and that's part of it. Tell me a little bit about, you, you mentioned shame and and that, that overwhelmingness that started to kind of engulf you. Well, I felt guilty for the way that I was managing the trauma, because it made my ex-husband feel or his needs weren't being met. And then I felt like just every, every single decision I had made, I started having shame about the, the being pregnant and, and a rushed marriage when we got married and then leaving the legacy of the work that I was doing in Orange County because I thought it was the best thing for my child and a lot of conflicting feelings that would always turn into shame. And I think for most trauma survivors that have related addiction and alcoholism, it, it leaves us in this place where the disassociated level is so hard to break through without a feeling of safety in our body and in our mind. And it did take a good yeah. decade after that for me to hit the depths of darkness and despair and, and finally just start with feeling safe in my body. About three, four years in the marriage, feeling like I was 
I had this double layer of the wife of and then the saver. I was an elected county supervisor and had been executive director of the Alameda County Family Justice Center that co-locates services for victims. I reached out for help in the when I was starting to see and others were pointing out to me that I may have a drinking problem. And so I did right. reach out for help. I didn't feel safe to go to the local rooms of 12 step recovery because my name was everywhere. I had just run for office. My face and my name were on people's doorsteps and that was the shame. Yeah. So yeah, can you can you talk about yeah. that a little bit because I'm just imagining like you're in this you're you're a public figure. Everybody knows you and and like you said you're being held held up so to speak as this you know leader and perfect person leader and and, safety, yeah. and in your pay you know and then here you are struggling internally with shame and like getting help or i mean that had to be i would imagine terrifying and that's this comes to my mind i'm just like oh my gosh so, how how absolutely. does someone go there so what happened and the thoughts are to connect with some listeners really was this feeling would be a burden on others that the and also there was some sense of shame in a, a level of worthiness that if i if i stop leading the whole sense of identity and purpose will be gone and so what happened really was when I reached out for help, three things happened in one year in the depths of this shame. And it was all connected to a sense of worthiness. And do I even deserve to get help? Now, those aren't thoughts that enter our head when you're in shame. It was a way right, of existence. Right. And my brother, who I had taken in, who was struggling with severe mental illness, attempted to take his life under our roof. We lost a child in utero, and when I reached out for help for the drinking, I ended up connecting to someone that I thought had my best interest in mind and was a peer and then like pierced through this isolation that I was existing in. Right, right. And ended up blackmailing me and the family and stalking online oh and my gosh. exploiting uh, photos of me online. And I think at that point, if my recovery had begun in the privacy of being Nadia Lockyer at the time, it would have been very different. Now, it would have been a heavy, heavy load to carry and to work through. Yet what happened after that was it was all put out in the media as this sex and drug scandal. And so that then yeah. added the layer to my own internal shame. That would be just shame upon shame, just like, oh my goodness. And I think what shame does and what it did for me then is it's just pure darkness and isolation. There's no yeah. voice or thought in, in your head to fight for yourself. And where it led me was to suicidality. And in those moments, the one thing that, that kept me going was my child. I had one son at the time. And it was this feeling and this sense of he represents this infinite life that I had seen and experienced in touch in the near-death car accident. And so over the next decade after treatment, jail, hospitalizations, and picking myself back up on this self-will and my to-do lists and cleaning up the wreckage, that didn't work. It, it came to seeing how my mind was working and how it had worked all along. And the place that I call a home within really is this space that is between my mind and between my higher power where I can breathe right. and feel safe in my body. And I can either choose to connect more to the soul answers and my higher power, or I can observe my mind. And 
knowing now today that it's that our minds are survivalist in nature and it will create mainly fears, mainly judgment. I recognize them all the time. Mm-hmm. It's living the work. I mean, most of our thoughts yeah. are based on fear. It's like, right? It's fear of yeah. Losing. We're survivalist animals. We're 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 threat animals. We we yeah. Fear and negativity. Uh, unfortunately, that is part of our bias. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But when we become aware, it's amazing how how much we will realize that most of our thoughts. You know, whether it's we're getting up on time or we're checking off the next thing on our to-do list or we we handle the situation with our children well, whatever it might be, it's related to a fear of a loss, a loss of purpose, a loss of love, a loss of something related to what our mind is saying defines our worth. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as, as you're, as you're talking about this, like, you're in this really dark space. Everything has kind of crumbled around you, and it's public, and you're in this deep moment of shame. And when was the moment where this started to shift for you? Like, you started to see, like, what you're describing, like. You started to see your own mind. I don't know if that makes sense. What was that moment? And and how did you find that? Or how did you get there? I was forced into treatment. And mm-hmm. the critical moment was when a therapist, who is still my therapist to this day, had listened to me crying and, the, and heartache about everything that had been said in the press the ex-husband and the feelings of powerlessness to get out of the marriage, the stuff with the courts. I mean, we're talking criminal court, family court, divorce court, and you know, a, a, a lot of things were going on. And I was just, everything was outside me. Everything. Yeah. And she said to me, Nadia, you are not a body, nor your thoughts. And I was almost offended at first because of the thing, the ways that I had felt harmed and violated. And she wrote something, a circle, and and then a pie piece. And she said, this is your true self and the only truth that matters. We are of and from a core innocence. And we're infinite, whole, and complete. And first hearing that was quite a shock. And our mind was like, is this it, it, like re- reset. You're like, oh my gosh, like, mm-hmm. uh, like this is, I, I never had thought I was so caught up in my own kind of thinking. I, I didn't, I didn't see it this way. And the, the pie piece is the ego mind she put and ego, not in egotistical or boastful, but in identity. And that was kind of the right. first initial starting point. During that same time, I was brought and introduced to Kundalini Yoga. And so I hadn't yet connected to this whole, infinite, complete existence and belief. And I believe that is the only truth that matters, that that is our true selves, that we are infinite, whole, divine, complete beings. But in Kundalini Yoga and breath work and its use of sound, it finally enabled me to sit and feel yeah. calm in my body and to breathe through the physical pain and to just feel safe. And so the combination of those two things, more Kundalini Yoga trainings, more therapy, eventually the layers, I like to call them, all the layers started lifting that were blocking me and that blocks so many people from that core truth and that innocence. And as the years continued, that when there were alcohol relapses, I I short, I'd have long lengths of sobriety and there'd be a day. Every single time it was a trauma related trigger and a flight, flight freeze, and that's all lingo and everything, but it literally was a layer that related to the adult trauma, the shaming, 
as well as the childhood trauma. And so I used it and saw it and my therapist and sponsor and the trauma specialist and Kundalini Yoga helped me realize that, okay, there's this reason, there's a core wound that's still blocking you from connecting to that core truth. And so we would walk through a past trauma incident and recreate the ending. We would focus again on breath and just connecting more and more and more to that truth. And as years passed, triggers and their power, trauma triggers became right. The power was reduced. And now, I mean, today, things will still come up. And it is whether my truth is acknowledged, whether somebody is hearing me out and or any brand, any shaming, anything of that sort. And they don't have power because when we are connected to that only truth that matters right here in the middle, I call it a home within. I know the truth and I know my mind is going to send fear and judgment-based thoughts to separate me from that truth. I can walk through those and I can be compassionate on myself, be compassionate with others and see that they're in their fear and judgment. And yeah. And <laughs> I like how you say like this, this wasn't like, it wasn't that you just changed the thought and then everything changed. It was a process of, of digging in the willingness to come back to it the willingness to have others help you that was a big you know one. walk through it I yeah would, especially when shame's there right because we just want to hide and like yeah i'm not telling anybody anything i'm but still like, working to be able on to, that to see i mean it. my fellowship has always been there and they i have a steady fellowship that yeah. i see every morning and you know the keep coming back phrase it's so hard to one day at a time all those they're hard to come alive in our in our heads when we are in that shame. And so again, that's where this right. place of okay, if I know that I'm fearful because of a belief that a relapse changed my core worth, okay, I can be aware of that and I can walk back in and however anybody might look at me, that doesn't change my truth and my core worth that I want sobriety, that I'm committed to sobriety, and that I am a good person or worthy of sobriety. I think a lot of people struggle to get back in the rooms, not yeah. oh, realizing yeah. that their mind's making that shame and separating them from that core innocence. And when you can start to see that, you can kind of be able to put that, that the, those the thoughts, phrases. those fears kind of to the side a little bit enough to like, at least reach out or go back to a meeting or find your support or therapist or wherever you wherever you get that like i can go back and re-engage again mm -hmm. i don't have to go isolate completely even if it's fearful but i can kind of put that fear in a i guess in a i don't want to say a container but like well, maybe a container but kind of off well, to the we'll side ourselves i don't have to too for having that fear and yeah. that's again the survivalist yeah. mind and and shame it's like why can't I get up and go? I hear I, there's so much shame in the addicted yeah. mind. And I think the addicted mind is shame. And yeah. really, it's really on high drive in the survivalist mode. And so we'll beat ourselves up for having fear. We'll recognize the fear and then say, you know, I shouldn't be fearful. And the aim in creating a home is saying, okay, mind. You think you're helping me survive today with this fear, but actually this is separating me from my core truth that I am whole, perfect, and complete, even if I had a relapse, if somebody's in that situation. And so I'm going to recognize this. I'm not going to beat it up. I'm not going to try and shut it off. At some point, you can get in meditation to a point where those reduce. But if they are active and alive, it's like, okay, this is my survivalist mind. I right. recognize it. I'm going to walk in and be connected to the only truth that matters. I think people get stuck thinking they have to shut it off or in the shame 
of having the thought. Does that so make sense? how do you do this? Like, yeah, no, it totally makes sense. The I totally path. understand that. And yeah, I, I totally resonate with that because I, I think in a way you, you have to be able to kind of have that mind state to be able to walk through all the, the, these difficult feelings and thoughts and, and have a way to conceptualize mm-hmm. them that, that allow us to do that. So how do you maintain this and work on this like on a, on a daily basis and, and, and nurture it, I guess? Every day. It's the first thing I do. And I have several different mantras and I often ask people, you know, what is your daily saying? And I start with, I am not a body nor the thoughts my mind makes. Because often I'll wake up with chronic pain and, and it's a home is within you. And that means that I will choose love over fear and judgment today. And every day we have a choice. And if we choose love, we will remember we're not bodies nor our thoughts and stay connected to that right. only truth. If, we're, if we choose fear and judgment, we're going to be gentle on ourselves when we notice it. But that's also the survivalist mind. And my therapist said to me, you know, anything that anybody does, anything that anybody does is either an act of love or a cry for love. I like that. Yeah. And so if I can look at myself in that way and others in that way, then others' projections aren't going to have as much of an effect on us. And our own interpretation in our head won't have as much of an effect. And we can go to self-compassion and say, I'm, I'm actually crying for love right now. And I'm going to reach out for help, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And be able to recognize it and, and see that. And and like, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of your old self, you know, like, cause you were, you know, with all that trauma, you know, the trauma to just work, work, work and do, 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 and be, 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 you, you can't stop to ask that very question to. No, are you kidding? Yeah. My to-do list. My, okay, get this done. You know, I mean, I was rigorous about cleaning up the wreckage. You know, I had put an ankle monitor on and I was tested like every two hours to prove I'm going to prove my sobriety and all these things, you know, and I got it all cleared up. You know, I finished, I'm going to just say it here. I finished a five-year probation. I finished with, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff, but none of that did the healing work within. I love that you say that. I love that you acknowledge that. I mean, that's so important to understand. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, thankfully, all along, the, the, the universe created a situation where I was forced, like I, I was on my knees, having been in the midst of my to-do list and clearing up wreckage that I know people in the program can relate to whether it's family stuff or court stuff or your health, whatever it might be. When we're in the midst of that, I found myself within a relapse and I could not understand. I could not understand it. Like this, you know, this is four years ago and could not understand it. And it was on my knees begging. I was at Linwood Women's Facility for about a week. and. It just was, I don't understand, on my knees. And it was then that all the work that I had started to do really stuck in. And it was, that's the problem. You don't have to do this. This is for your higher power. This is all of it. All these things you feel powerless over, the yearning to have my children full time, all kinds of stuff. Once I started just putting that out into my, into it is what I call it, ek and kundalini yoga, into the universe's hands, it just was like this massive load off of my shoulders. I don't have to figure it out. Everything seems to resolve itself on its own. Yep. When we let go. Yeah, it'll take care of itself. However, that's going to be, it'll be. I mean, Pain and suffering aren't pain and suffering. 
when we can find that neutral space where it's like sitting and it's waiting, what is the lesson in here? Where is this leading me? How is it getting me closer to my true self and real joyful happiness comes? Yeah. Yeah. Finally, it does. (laughs) It does. Uh, How... So how are you taking that mm-hmm. into the world now with your family, your kids, your mm-hmm. all of that? How, how is that manifesting there? It's pretty awesome to be a mom again of their seven because every day I call it living the work. It's being my own caretaker of my own trauma marked little girl and how she little Nadia, you know, existed in the world. I have to be aware of when the survival list ways come up and it's as soon as we wake up and when I'm aware and then I can see my little ones in their own patterns and their own processing of things, I get to be a present mom and I get to say, okay, you know, point at the feelings chart on the wall, name the feeling or flip it. If, if you're upset that they hit you, okay, flip it. What's really going on in their head? How can we understand what's happening in each person? And this is where the fear and judgment awareness, and then choosing love, because the more that I share these stories as a mother, the more other moms are learning that their own healing and work can help them be a better conscious parent. So some of the stuff that I'm doing live on Instagram is about that living the work. I'm also yeah. teaching Kundalini yoga. And if you're interested in that, you can connect to my Instagram and I'm doing a home is within you workshop. I've d- I did one last year on my own and I'm doing one through woman for sobriety. And so those will be replicated. And awesome. Yeah, it's really great. What about like, you know, like as you're doing all this and you're you're manifesting all this, like choosing to to write a book about it, to write a book about your journey. I mean, coming from where you were, where in, in the public there was, you know, you're you didn't have the luxury of having your process private. I mean, it was it was out there, it was out there for the world. And now you're writing a a, a book and you're you're doing that again. So tell me a little like writing this book and putting this book out and it is and doing out. That. It was released. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was released April 25th. And the book includes my father's heritage story, which in and of itself is just amazing. An orphan field worker who overcame multiple challenges to become the first Spanish speaking lawyer in California and changed the law for the better in so many ways. And then it also includes how I followed in his footsteps to write the huge community effort to free Arthur Carmona, wrongfully convicted youth. And so after those two things happened in my life, meaning my dad became who he was, I was in law school, I had the near-death accident and was fighting to free Arthur. After all of that, the book idea kept being mentioned to me and you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And then I married and all the adult trauma ended up happening up North. And so I had begun somewhat writing my father's story. And then of course, as an attorney had all the documentation for Arthur, but in that darkest of hour, when I was on my knees, when I was sharing that earlier, It was my father's spirit and it was Arthur's spirit that truly came to me and said, remember your truth. The truth will prevail regardless of what anybody has said or done about you out there. That is not real life right here, right now. And so to answer your question, I began writing with my father and then Arthur's story. And then slowly, all the learnings in recovery and this grand message I wanted to teach my sons and everybody else out there struggling about how to find a middle ground 
began to unfold. And the best word that came up with it was, this is about home. This is a sense of home and having that one singular place that is safe, calm, judgment-free within yourself where all the other learnings and healing modalities, everything else can be embraced. Just start from this one place. And so that's how it started. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that you're willing to share your story and just so openly and frankly, and to give that to other people who are struggling with addiction and mental health issues that like, look, there, there's, there's, there's ways out. There's, there's support, there's help out there. You can, you can do it. You, we we can inspire others. We have to the shame. And I think by yeah. sharing our stories loudly, others don't have to suffer silently. I've heard. And it's so true. Yep. It's so, so true. So true. So as we get close to our time here, I just like to ask like one more question. Mm -hmm. And that's just if, if someone out there is in a similar situation of your, as yours and they're listening and they're struggling and you, you could tell them one thing, what, what would it be? What would you say to them? I would say to close your eyes and take a deep breath and that your true self is there unchanged by anything that has happened to you, anything that you have done. And in that space, you will find the courage to reach out for help, which is the most courageous thing to do. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Where can people find you? Because you, you, like you said earlier, you, uh, you teach uh, yoga, you do these retreats. So how can people find you? It would be www.nadia-davis.com. And there's links to all events. I have three upcoming book events May this Saturday and then May 20th, June 15th. And then there's yoga every Sunday at six. But you can link to everything on the website. Instagram, I strongly encourage you, is at Nadia Maria Davis. And if anybody knows anybody struggling or somebody that needs this in treatment, jail or the hospital, I'd be more than happy to get this to them. So. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. I'm going to put all those links in the show notes at theaddictedmind.com so they can also get it there. Okay. So they don't have to remember it. They can check it out. Nadia, just thank you for having the courage to share your story and, and talk about it and give that gift to so many people. It's my hope that someone relates to some part of it and the shame within his band. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nadia, thank for coming you on. for what you do. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the Addicted Mind podcast. As usual, you can find all the show notes at theaddictedmind.com. So check them out there. And if you enjoyed this episode, think about sharing it with a friend. And don't forget, click the subscribe button in whatever podcast app you use so you get the latest episode in your feed. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And I'll talk to you on the next episode.